Andy Kopp here from the University of Bristol, uh, and he'll be speaking to us today about indefinite zeta functions. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so indefinite zeta functions. I yeah, so I'll start by talking a bit. I'll, I'll start by outlining the talk. So, right, I'm my motivation for this work comes out of Hilbert's twelfth problem. So I'll talk about that a bit. Um, and then um, I will sort of segue into sort of a, a general construction, really two general constructions of you know, indefinite theta, theta functions and indefinite zeta functions, um, which um, are at least can be thought of sort of orthogonal to the, to, to the motivation. Um, and then I'll sort of bring it back at the end um, and talk about a, a sort of a application to something related to the, the motivating problem. Um, yeah, so start with what is Hilbert's 12th problem? Well, um, you may know that Hilbert published a List a uh, famous list of 23 open problems in 1900, and some of them have been solved. Some of them are still open, such as the Riemann hypothesis, and and such as the the twelfth problem, which asked about uh, extensions of Kronecker's theorem on abelian fields to any algebraic realm of rationality. So, what does that mean in modern language? Well, the Kronecker Kronecker's theorem or the Kronecker Weber theorem. That's Kronecker and Weber pictured under Hilbert. Um, they, it says that the abelian Galois extensions of the rationals are generated by the values of the complex exponential at rational numbers, right? And the, in other words, they are the subfields of cyclotomic fields. So, so the Q ab is the union of all the cyclotomic fields, right? And so it's a classic, classical theorem and we, we want to generalize this or Hilbert wanted to, to generalize this to arbitrary base field and, and moreover inter find what are the analytic functions that play the role of the complex exponential um, for a base field K, say a number field. Okay, and so um, the imaginary quadratic case, imaginary quadratic base field, was mostly already known to, to Hilbert. Um, it uses the, the theory of elliptic curves with complex multiplication due to, to Weber and others. Um, so, and, and then there's, there, I should mention abstract class field fields by embedding them in a much larger field. Um, you know, you find the find of the class field inside some much larger thing. And um, I should also mention um, Shimura, who generalized CM theory to any CM base field, um, any you know, totally complex degree two totally complex extension of a totally real field um, by you know, replacing the elliptic and curves with abelian varieties. Um, but this also doesn't give a anything like a com complete answer to this this problem, um, although it's a beautiful theory. And so, uh, I'm going to talk about a sort of a, a another approach um, in the the so Harold Stark in um, the eighties the seventies and early eighties came up with a series of conjectures and sort of in the, the most general form they're about art and L functions. Um, and so uh, the R and L function of a Galois representation of number field, of an extension of number fields L over K. And they are about the Taylor series expansion at S equals zero or you could, you could phrase it in terms of a Taylor series at S equals one as well, but it's a little nicer at zero. There's a functional equation, right? And so the, the leading coefficient 
CR is, well, yeah, the leading coefficient is supposed to be a product of some fairly simple algebraic number and a more, more complicated object called a Stark regulator, which is a determinant of an R by R matrix of linear forms of logarithms of algebraic units. And they're supposed to be algebraic units in the field L. Um, so, and in particular, when uh, you have an abelian extension, this this L function is a Hecke L function. So it's, and this is the case I'm going to focus on. So it's specified by data in internal decay. It's specified by a Hecke character, um, chi. In the in the case of the rational numbers, these are Dirichlet L functions. Chi would be a Dirichlet character. Okay, and the units these are predicted to live in the corresponding class field, which is, is just L in this, in this setup. Okay, and so in particular, when, when R is one and you have a rank, order vanishing is one, rank one, we call this, this, this is the, that you can recover the Stark units by exponentiation, right? And so this is, gives a, some sort of, uh, you know, a partial answer to Hilbert's wealth problem in this in this rank one case because here is some cool analytic function that's that's giving you generators for these class fields, um, but it's it's a conjecture, right? And they, it remains open over, for example, any real quadratic field, which is the case I'm going to focus on in this in this talk. Um, okay, and so I just want to give you a few examples of of the Stark conjectures. Um, so this is a rational example, meaning the base field is Q. And this is if you if you're bored during the talk and want to work on some want something to do, you can you can try to prove this identity. You can prove it with with calculus. So the left-hand side, what is the interpretation of this identity? The left-hand side is L1 of chi, a Dirichlet L value. You know, so I, I'm switching back and forth between S equals zero and S equals one throughout this talk based on what gives you the nicest formulas. But there, there, are, there are functional equations for all the, the L functions I'm going to talk about that allow you to switch between zero and one. Um, so L of... So the left-hand side is L of one chi, where chi is two on n, the Jacobi symbol. Um, and that's the, the, the character associated with the, the field extension, q adjoining root two of, over q. And the right-hand side involves the fundamental unit of this, this field, q adjoining root two. Um, so that's sort of the prototype um, you can, Prove statements like this for any Dirichlet L function with pretty elementary <laughs> methods. Um, and, but then it gets it more complicated when you, so here's a more complicated example, but that is still a known. So this is, this is a, a formula that you could prove using the theory of complex multiplication for a particular elliptic curve and um, the left hand, and so what is the interpretation of this one? Well, we've got a sum over a lattice on the left hand side, and we've got some sort of simple pi, pi times an algebraic, a simple algebraic number, and then a log of a more complicated algebraic number. Um, and the, the left hand side is a, it's a, so a particular linear combination of heck L values at s equals one for this, the the field Q joins square root of minus three. So that's, that's our base field in this case. And the right-hand side involves an algebraic unit in the Ray class field modulo five for this field. And the relationship to elliptic curves, well, you can, you look at the, you know, 
the elliptic curve y squared equals x cubed plus one, which has uh, cm by this field and the you know, you, it, this formula comes out of looking at the, the values of the you know, elliptic functions at the five torsion points. Um, so yeah, you can, if you understand that elliptic curve very well, you can, you can, and you can prove this, and, but it's, yeah, it's starting to get, get a bit more complicated, right? And, um, and now here we have a, a similar looking formula, um, but this one is open. Um, so the, you might see that, that you might notice that there's no longer, it's no longer a sum over a, a lattice on the left. It's now a, a restriction of a lattice to um, some sort of, um, yeah, some points, some over points of points in a cone. Um, and that's, a, that's gonna come back throughout the talk that there'll be. Um, restrictions to cones and sort of things like that. <laughs> um, and the, because, and the, the reason why is because there's a, there's a, fu a fundamental unit in the space field, uh, uh, a, a unit, a unit of infinite order that makes a, you know, and you, you, you know, restricting to a fundamental domain of the action of that unit is, is restricting to that cone. Um, so yeah, so I, I should say, yeah, the left hand, um, um, yeah, mouse. Uh, the the left hand side is is a you know, combination of tech L, L values for Q joins square root of three, um, uh, and but conductor five and the, the or five and one infinite place. I think I should say. And the right hand side is yeah. This this ep, epsilon is an algebraic unit in the narrow array class field of Q joins root three. And you can you can check both both of those things, but you this this equal equal sign is only something you can prove you know to a hundred decimal places or whatever. You can't it's it's not known to actually be. Um, yeah, and I should say um, I should erase that picture, and I should say that right that if you're sort of have done a lot of experimental math, you might say, okay, hold on, this left-hand side, that, that sum looks like it converges pretty slowly. How are you going to check something like this? And, you know, hold that question, I guess, that, you know, that there are, there are ways, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, I guess I should ask, are there, are there any uh, questions at this point from the audience? Okay. Feel free to interrupt if you if you have a question. So now I'm gonna yeah the chronic limit formulas, which is um, in, mentioned in the abstract. So yeah, I should tell you what those are. So in the, um, the so the classical chronic limit formulas um, in the imaginary quadratic case. Um, you know, so L values relate to special values of modular forms. Um, and you can show that by, you know, or, or elliptic functions if you, if you like by, and you can show that by the chronic limit formulas. And so the first formula um, is a formula, it's for the real analytic Eisenstein series, but you can, you know, which specializes to um, some, a, a ray class, you know, a, a, or a, a class zeta function, or a, which is a particular linear combination of tech L functions for um, of conductor one, um, when tau is specialized to just a imaginary quadratic number like square root of minus five. Um, uh, so, and the formula here. So 
it's a, this is the you see this limit, um, which is why it's called the limit is that there's a limit as s goes to one of e of tau s minus that's that's the leading term of the Laurent expansion at s equals one um, equals this. There's this transcendental factor of um, or presumably transcendental, not a uh, factor of, of the uh, euler mascheroni constant, just sort of like, just like you get for, for zeta, the Riemann zeta. And then there's this minus two log of this absolute value of two squared of imaginary part of tau times uh, eta of tau, where eta is the Dedekind eta function. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the the relationship to modular forms. Um, and so yeah, when you yeah, so I should tell you about the second limit formula. And at this at this point, the it's sort of weird that I'm calling them limit formulas because there's no limit. But I'm just going to do that anyway. Um, because that's that's the what they're called historically. So the the second limit formula, um, it's for a, a it's similar, but it's for a, a twisted real analytic Eisenstein series, and so it's twisted by by an additive character of of well, if if p one and p two are rational uh, are rational with denominator n, it would be or uh, character of z mod n, n z squared, right? And but you could you could twist by you could put real numbers in here for p one and p two, and it still makes sense. Um, so, and that I, I'm also um, using, I'm, I'm completing by putting in the gamma factor because that gives you a nicer formula in this case. And so there's, there's no, there's no uh, euler mascheroni constant anymore. This, this, is a, this is sort of a, it's kind of a nicer formula. So you just, you just have a minus two times log of absolute value of, of a modular function. Um, appearing in this, this second limit formula. Right. Yeah. And so this is the, the Jacobi data function and the, the eta function, the Vatican eta on the bottom. Okay. So this is the formula that I am going to prove in an analog of at the end of the talk. Um, Okay, and so yeah, the one approach to to the Stark conjectures is to find the Kronecker limit formulas for real quadratic fields, or to you know, if if you, I mean, it, or it's it seems like it's at least one of the ingredients that would would have to go on a proof. You you would want to you you would want some kind of formula for these numbers that you're trying to prove are. Out algebraic more than like what you get when you analytically continue this data function, <laughs> right? Uh, so there are analogs of the first limit formula due to Hecke and due to Perglotz and Zagie and Shintani and so working around the same time as Stark was found an analog of the, the second limit formula. And in 1978, use it to prove a special case of the star conjectures in the real quadratic case. Um, so this this did there. Um, but and I should just yeah. And so the, this has gotten some some mileage out of this. But um, the and um, all of these formulas. Um, interpolate between these so when I say interpolate like the the real analytic Eisenstein series interpolate between imaginary quadratic data functions and so the and these 
rely on a similar sort of interpretation, which is by restrict, you know, where you, something like an Epstein's eta function where you sum over a, a cone rather than the whole complex space. I mean, sorry, the, rather than the whole lattice. Um, that, that's so that, and I'm gonna discuss a, a different sort of interpolation. And the way my interpolation works is you sort of insist on it, the functional equation being true and um, do what, and follow your nose, <laughs> basically. And so based on, you know, so I, I will show that you can take a new, a new chronic limit formula with it that's based, you know, will of course give you the same, you know, same values of the special points that we're interested in, but the, the values in between are, are different. Um, and, and this also gives is a fa fast converging analytic formula um, for presumptive Stark units. Um, so it's, it's good for computation, but as, as far as, as of yet, um, there doesn't seem to be much hope of proofing algebraicity with, with this method. Um, so it's, um, and yeah, okay. And at this, at this point, if you're, if you're starting to get bored or <laughs> you've been tuning me out, you know, you, you can, you can, uh, imagine that the talk has started over and this is uh, a new topic. Uh, so, um, is, yeah, so uh, uh, in what, are, what are indefinite theta functions? So indefinite theta functions were introduced by Chandra's Wagers in his PhD thesis. And um, I'm, you may you may know you may have there, I, I think there were some previous talks in the series about this right that so these the, these have been used to you know he he used them to build weak harmonic MOS forms whose holomorphic parts are Ramanujan's mock theta functions so the, you know, Ramanujan wrote down these mock theta functions and their various remarkable identities they satisfied in his lost notebook and wasn't fully explained where, you know, the, the, the infinite family that these are things are part of wasn't really discovered until this, until, two, um, until Zweiger's thesis. And yeah, this, this work along with work of Patrick Bergman and Ken Ono um, led to, as you probably know, mock modular forms becoming a very uh, active and a, field with, you know, major contributions from Larry Rowland and among other people. Um, and yeah, as you see, here's a picture of Shonder Weyers and, and Katrin Bringman in the middle with a theta function and Ken Ono is a, is a triathlete. So there he is finishing the, the marathon portion. This is the, the final segment of the triathlon. Um, yeah, and so Generalizing, so yeah, so my, I'm going to talk a bit about, I'm going to not use Zweiger's notation, I'm going to do, do, some, do something slightly, a slightly more general version um, for, and, which is sort of, you know, a, a Siegel modular version of the indefinite theta. Um, and the so this the purpose of this slide is if you if you've read other things about indefinite theta functions such as Zweiger's thesis or or Larry's notes um, what uh, just telling you what I'm doing differently and if if you haven't it, you can ignore this slide so um, the the comparison between so that what what do I what is the the added value of my uh, my def my 
version of the indefinite theta. It's you, you replace, instead of um, having a, a tau and an m, a ta tau in the upper half plane and m, a uh, symmetric matrix of signature g minus one, one, you, you look, you instead have this sort of Siegel modular kind of thing where you have o, omega is n plus i m, where m is the imaginary part of this complex symmetric matrix has genus g minus one, one, and n is any real symmetric matrix. And that's, that part of the generalization is fairly straightforward. You, but then, then you're sort of forced um, to also allow C1 and C2 to take complex values. And the reason you're forced to do that is because when you try to write down the transformation law, laws that it, they, you know, you're, you, yeah, you just end up having to, to consider this. Um, so, yeah, so the, and that's, that's not so straightforward. Um, so uh, I will now just discuss my point of view on, on indefinite theta. So there I'll, you know, this is, you, you may remember the, you may know what the Siegel upper half plane is. That's, that's complex matrices, it's complex symmetric matrices whose imaginary part is positive definite. So this is a generalization of the Siegel upper half plane or the Siegel upper half space. Um, and say, G, call it a, say it has genus G and index K. And the, the reason for the word genus here is um, like uh, abelian varieties of genus. Well, I'll, 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 that's, I think this is on the next slide. Yeah, where, yeah, that, um, you know, abelian varieties of dimension G, which include Jacobians of curves of genus G are, are associated, are associated to points in the Siegel upper half space, um, principally polarized abelian varieties. So, yeah, but it's, you know. And so um, what is, and another way to see, to see well, the, what this HGK is, well, it's, there's, there's a, the union of all these HGK that, um, or just all, all complex symmetric matrices, um, which I guess also includes the one where um, the imaginary part is singular, right? That this whole space has a symplectic group action given by fractional linear transformations, um, which you have to be a bit careful about defining because matrix multiplication isn't commutative, but that, that is the definition. Um, A omega plus B times C omega plus D inverse. And the H, G, upper K are the, are the open orbits of this symplectic group action. So that's another, another way to think of them. Okay. And so, as I said, the, the Siegel upper half space mod SP2Z is, that's the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension G. Yeah. Um, and so you, wa you might want to do something different for these other spaces. You consider the SP2Z action and you know, the points do, there. you can sort of do a moduli interpretation where these correspond to certain non-algebraic complex tor tori of dimension G, this, this, the points of this quotient space. But there's a problem. So the problem is that you know, this is a, kind of an ugly space. <laughs> There's, the action is not properly discontinuous. So you, uh, so you, um, and so the way you fix this is, or the way that one way to fix this, and I'll just talk about the case K equals one, um, 
uh, you can fix the, the action by adding an auxiliary parameter, C. Um, and you have to impose this condition um, that the conjugate transpose of C times imaginary part of omega time, times C, that, that product is negative. Um, so that's, and then those, if you, you sort of tag every omega with, with a C, then the action on those pairs is now totally just properly discontinuous. And you could, you could, you could tag them with two, two C's, a C1 and a C2, and that also works, which is sort of what, we, what, what you do in, when you define these indefinite uh, theta functions. Right, and so that this is, well, first I should say, okay, what's the definition of the, yeah, so that's just kind of a geometric, you know, if you, way to think about what I'm about to do algebraically <laughs> on the next two slides. So the, the, the Riemann theta function, which I'm gonna call the definite theta function is, is this is the, the classical definition of the, the Riemann theta function. Um, so, you know, right in, in one variable, very well, you know, when G is one, the, this is the, the Jacobi theta function. You said so N squared, you know, omega is like tau, this is like N squared, N squared tau, and this is N times Z. Um, and, and so in, in general, you know, you're replacing, we're replacing tau with this um, omega um, in the seagull upper half space. And this sum only converges, um, you know, if you try to put in some other, some omega where the imaginary part is not positive definite, you, you'll get a non, a sum that doesn't converge. So it, um, yeah. And so the question is, okay, yeah, how do you fix this? And, and so you fix it by putting in this, the C1 and C2 um, and, and then introducing this crazy uh, weight function. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I, here I should I should say uh, something, um, right? It, it the um, uh, no, just, so you know. Yeah, so I'll just draw this. Yeah. So um, the C, C1 and C, so, you know, the C1 and C2 are like, defined like a dual cone to, and then there's a, um, but this, yeah, it, it's a little bit, yeah, that, um, yeah, that there's, but the, basically, and you could, um, if you look at the cone where um, this um, the quadratic form given by n transpose m n that where that that indefinite quadratic form if you look at the cone where it's positive or the, the, that takes positive values and then you were restrict to some subcone of that cone, then the sum over that will, will converge. And so instead, of, you really, you know, if your goal is just to get a convergent sum, you don't need to introduce some crazy uh, fu uh, function like this, weight function like this. You could just uh, say, take a characteristic function of one of those, some cone over which, you'll get a convergent sum. Um, 
And this is, this function is this, this, you know, this function, um, this E function uh, is of rapid decay outside a, a certain cone of that form. And that, that, is, that is why this is a convergence sum. Um, but the, I mentioned earlier wanting to maintain a, a, a functional equation or from the theta functions perspective, wanting to maintain modularity. And that, that is the point of this, this, this incomplete Gaussian integral or, or a Gaussian error function as, as you might call it is, is a, a, a way to, is, is the function that you need to maintain modularity. Um, and so that, that's the, so. Now that you've had a bit of time to stare at that, oh, uh, yeah, so that, yeah, I, this, this, this series converges absolutely. Um, and the, you know, that I'm going to introduce a slightly different notation, which involves characteristics. Um, and so this is just, there's this exponential factor out front, but the main thing to see here is the um, Z is being replaced by P plus omega Q. And P and Q can be any real numbers here. We're not restricting to rational characteristics. So it's just a, it's just a different formulation of different, different notation for the same function, more or less. But, um, yeah, and so there's the definite version and the indefinite version. And finally, uh, okay, so the transformation laws. And so I've written them in parallel here, the, the definite case and the indefinite case. And so in the definite case, so that the, there's sort of nothing to, there's nothing to see here, right? The, the you know, right? So this is a, you're thinking of this as like a Jacobi form. There's an elliptic, transformation laws and their modular transformation laws. And the elliptic, so the elliptic transformation laws look exactly the same and the, these cone parameters C1 and C2 don't really play a role in it. It's sort of get everything for free. Okay, and then, so the, the modular transformation laws, that there it gets a little more interesting. So, okay, here is that I needed to, they didn't both fit on one slide. So here's the, here's the uh, definite case. Um, and these, this, these transformation laws here, that they, they correspond to the generators for the, you know, the, these, these transformations generate the symplectic group, uh, SP, SPN of Z, SPG of Z. G. So the yeah, and so the those one and two are um, fairly straightforward to prove, and three um, is the one that you need Poisson summation for, and so the proof the you end up doing a Fourier transform, and that's where that square root of determinant of i omega inverse comes from. Okay, and now the indefinite case, you get. Very similar formulas. So again, if you if you just erase the the superscripts, it would be the same as the previous slide. However, the superscripts do get affected by the action. So the, the cone parameters do do get get acted on by these transformations. And you'll see in three, um, you end up, which is also surprise, surprise, a you know a Poisson summation proof. But the 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 super the you know the cone parameters uh, get you know if you started with real cone parameters, you'd end up getting complex ones out of this, and so that's why you need to talk about complex ones to 
make it ice theory. Okay. So um, I guess, are, are there any questions at this point? Okay, so I'll talk about, you know, so yeah, we finally get to the title of the talk, indefinite zeta functions, right? So the indefinite zeta functions, I'm just gonna define uh, definite and indefinite zeta functions um, to be the Mellon transforms respectively of the definite beta function and the de definite, um, the indefinite beta function with, and um, you know, using this characteristics notation and I'm putting a, a, a dummy variable T in there to, to do my Mellon transform over. And, yeah, and so the, the, yeah, the, everything is, all of the, the decorations on the theta are, continue to be the decorations on the zeta. They're, they're these character, it's the characteristics and the cone parameters and of course the, Real symmetric matrix omega, or complex symmetric matrix omega. Yeah. Okay, and here is the formula for the analytic continuation. And if you've, you know, you, you might this might look familiar to you if you've done lots of, if you've ever worked through an analytic continuation of. A theta function before, yeah. So there, there's this, this R, um, yeah. So the, the interesting thing about this is, you know, so you, you have to use the the this third modular transformation law to to get this formula, and to, but it um, you you break up this this integral into a piece from zero to to R and and a piece from R to infinity, and then you apply the transformation law to the second piece or to the, the first piece <laughs> yeah the piece from zero to r and this is a, a, a actually a useful formula for computations in the sense that well it's or a, a not terrible formula for computations because it converges uh, to arbitrary precision in polynomial time <laughs> at least for you know if you choose an r that's well, any any like constant choice of R like one. Um, so yeah, so um, and as a corollary you get the functional equation um, which is a symmetry about the line G over two. And so in the case G equals two, which will be the case that's relevant to real quadratic fields so that that application um, it's um, S goes to one minus S, just like the the zeta, the Riemann zeta function. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll let you look at that for a minute. Yeah. Okay. So, and now I'm going to shift gears a bit. So yeah, I, I guess are are there any questions right now before I shift gears? Okay. So, Ray class groups. Um, yeah, so I need, I'm, I'm going to sort of shift back towards the, the application to, or the potential application to, to explicit class field theory. So, um, what is the, the Ray class group? Well, this is what it is. So K is a, but yeah, so if K is a number field, then OK is a string of integers. Um, and C is an idea which is going to be the, the conductor and S is a, well, C and, and S together are the conductor. S is a subset of the, the real embeddings of K. Yeah. Um, and so if, if you, yeah, it, if C was one and S was empty, this would be the usual class group. Fractional ideals modulo principal fractional ideals. And what this C and S do, um, don't worry about the co prime to C on the, in the numerator. Um, it, it all it's real, what it's really doing is it's making the, the group you're modding out by smaller. And so 
you get a larger a larger group, and which will surject onto the usual class group. And then there, there are array class fields associated to, to this, which I, I mentioned. But yeah, I, I, I'm not going to dwell on the class field theory. Uh, so, hello. Ah, is there a quote? Yeah. Did someone? Did someone have a question? Okay, I guess I'll continue. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so there's, as if you take a class in this, so, a, you know, which is a, a set of fractional ideals, right, and you consider the, the integral ideals in this class and you sum over the norms of those ideal to the minus s that defines a zeta function. Um, this is, um, you know, if you, if you, you know, the, if you, if you like thinking about HECA L functions, this is like a HECA L function where, or it's, it's the, All, all, you know, you sum, you know, you're summing over all of the ideals where the Hecke character takes a particular value, where some Hecke character is, has some value. So it's, it's like a, you, know, you can go back and forth between these and Hecke L functions by linear, by linear algebra. Yeah. Um, and so it's, yeah. Um, yeah, and um, so, and then R, yeah, I'm gonna need this different zeta func function, um, which is a per particular difference of two of these zetas, so, um, so R is the, the class of things that are one, minus one mod the mod C and are positive at the uh, infinite places in S. And then you take this difference of say to S A and say to S R times A where that's the multiplication in the, in the group. Um, and that the zeta, zeta SA has a pole at S equals one, but ZA of S does not have a pole at S equals one. That, that's, this kills the, the, the poles cancel. So. Um, okay, and so, yeah, I'm, yeah, and so here is the, application to, to real quadratic fields. If you, K is a real quadratic field and C is a non-zero ideal, then okay. Um, and so if you, if you take a ray class uh, modulo C and both infinite places, um, you can make various choices um, and you, you can write Z, you can write Z A of S in terms of, you know, a, as a specialization of the indefinite zeta function. So this is just saying the indefinite zeta function specializes to the, to these Z A, Z sub A of S difference, difference zeta fun functions. And, and these same different zeta functions appear in uh, Sark's third paper about the one about real quadratic fields, third, third, the, his third paper in this in the series. 
of yeah, L functions at S equals one. And so the, you know, but it's, it's a little bit different is it's, it's only using one infinite place rather than both. Um, um, but that can be, so, you know, in some sense, this is, this is providing finer, finer data because, um, you know, you can write this, the zeta functions for the, the class field modulo. Well, just one of the infinite places is as a sum of two from the, the class field modulo, both infinite places. Um, yeah, but so in, in particular, this, this will, will, formula will provide a, an analytic formula for log of epsilon b for b stark unit b epsilon b um, so yeah this is best illustrated with an example uh, so this is uh, k is going to be square q join root three and c is going to be the uh, the conductor is going to be five and um, if at, with one infinite place, um, the class group is Z mod eight Z, cyclic group of order eight. Um, yeah, I'm not expecting you to be able to check this in your head and on the fly, but um, the class group modulo both infinite places, you also get a Z mod two Z factor. Right? That, and so the class I is splits as a disjoint union of a class I plus and a class I minus in this um, larger class group. Okay. And so Z sub I of S is Z sub I plus of S plus Z sub I minus S. But in this particular case, not in general, um, it turns out that the sub i minus is just identically zero, so the only thing to consider is the c sub i plus. And then I, I do a bit of, I use one of the transformation laws for this indefinite zeta to write it as a sum of three terms. And I just do that for sort of to get something that's more, converges more quickly and I'll, get into that a little more a little bit later but uh, the the point is that you can use this formula you can use well you can yeah that you can check that that you're in fact getting what you're supposed to get this you're, you're in fact getting it and and this is this is one of one of the methods that you can use to compute that that slum sum that I said was slow converging earlier uh, you know, compute it quickly or you know, to a high precision. Okay. And so now I'm going to talk about, yeah, I should talk about Kronecker limit formulas since, yeah. Um, so, um, this, so if you, uh, yeah, so Right, I introduced this, this definite zeta function and the indefinite zeta function. And so I, I'm going to show the Kronecker limit formulas for both of them in parallel. And the Kronecker limit formula for definite zetas, this is, this is just a, 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 this is a generalization of the second Kronecker limit formula. So you see this, this function FP is, Looks very looks like this thing that showed up in the absolute value before, except that there's a little exponential phase factor out front. And I'm going to need a particular logarithm of this function, which you could define well by this limiting condition or by it's sort of just it's just the thing you take, get when you take logarithms term by term in the product. And the, yeah, and so the sec, the generalized second Kronecker limit formula, so the formula for this 
definite zeta function um, with Q is zero, P is arbitrary um, of yeah, any omega at S equals one. Um, and you get two values of this log f p1 p2 function um, at two solutions to a quadratic equation that comes out of your quadratic form. Um, and the, in the case when n is zero, um, when omega is just I am, then tau plus is, or the, the complex conjugate of tau plus is minus tau minus. So this, you, you can combine these two logarithms into one and get um, is exactly the, this, the Kronecker second limit formula. Um, okay, and so the second, yeah, and so the, the indefinite version uh, is going to be a little more complicated, and I'm not going to, so the, there's this, uh, going to be this kappa, which is the square root of a, of a rational function in all the parameters. So it's the, the, the top here is, the numerator here is linear and the bottom is like square root of a, of a well, yes, it's degree three halves, yeah, I guess. Yeah, so it's, it's a bit, yeah, but it, um, so that this function, yeah, and then there's this function phi, which is similar to the function f, phi sub p, which is like f sub, phi sub p1, p2, which is like f sub p1, p2, except that um, it's not gonna be modular. It's, it looks, it looks kind of similar, except it's, you know, you this, you're dividing these two terms in the product. It's, you could write it in with you know, QPOC hammer symbols, but it's not, it's not a modular thing. It's some sort of weird thing. You can, you can define its logarithm. Uh, yeah, you can find the logarithm the same way, sort of the same way as before. And then this is what the formula looks like. So you get, um, the indefinite zeta function at s equals one is equal to a sum of four values of this integral. And there's a dialogarithmic term plus this integral of this log phi function um, with, against this kappa function. And the, you introduce a, a quadratic form associated to the to a lambda c which has a definite uh, imaginary part it's constructed from the cone parameters and and omega and the the roots of that play a similar role to the the roots of the quadratic form in the definite case um, and so i'm gonna i'm running low on time so i'm gonna go very quickly through the proof sketch um, so you compute a, a, you know, it's like proving the, uh, the, the second Kronecker limit formula you can prove by taking the, the looking at the Fourier expansion of uh, an Eisenstein series. And this is the sort of the same idea of, as that, except the, um, I introduce a dummy variable, which is maybe not strictly necessary, but it's, it makes, you know, it makes the analysis nice. Um, yeah, so there's this psi here is a dummy variable. It's maybe not the same psi as on the as before, but yeah. And in the the definite case, you're just kind of following your nose, and the, you, then you have to use the tri Jacobi triple product at the end. But in the indefinite case, it's more complicated. Um, so this these are the expressions you get for the Fourier coefficients. Um, you get this 
these integrals um, and that look like that. Looks like a big mess, but, and you then are like, oh, just combine all those integrals into one integral, switch the sum of the integral. It doesn't work because you, you, you just, yeah, it just doesn't, but you don't get something convergent when you do that. Um, you don't have, but absolute convergence. And so you, you can shift the, some of the integrals up and some of them down before you switch the sum of the integral and then it works. <laughs> and so you, you very, you pick the right choice of signs for the, uh, for a, some constant lambda with the, whose sign depends on a K and N and then, and then you switch the sum of the integral and then, um, yeah, you, you get something that looks like that over a horizontal contour. Um, but then, and then to get something rapidly convergent, um, you, you look at the singularities of this kappa function. There are sort of two isolated singularities that don't really do anything, and then there are two branch cuts. And so then you, you collapse the singularity onto the branch cuts. And so, yeah, I had an example I was going to go through, but I can, I can stop now. Um, All right, well, let's thank uh, Gene for a beautiful talk. I can't see most people, but yeah, you can clap icon or some, a couple of us can clap on camera. Um, great, so any questions for Gene? All right, well, I guess I have a question. Um, yeah. But yeah, what do you get if you do higher signature or more general signature things? More yeah, that's, like, that's, that's a great question. Um, I don't know, right? So that there is, there is a paper by, yeah, so, so yeah, so, so there, yeah, there's been some work done um, on generalizing Zwagers to, work to higher signature um, and it's, yeah. And rather than, yeah, you need more, more parameters to, you need more C's to define your cone. So it's, mm -hmm. and, um, and then you get these higher, higher error functions. Yeah. yeah. And I, I believe there shouldn't be any difficulty in carrying that over um, to, yeah, to this the Siegel Siegel modular setting, but the, then the the difficulty becomes um, yeah. I mean that the yeah. It's I haven't done it because well uh, yeah I haven't done it, but I I, I expect it, you sh it should be pop, you should be able to to generalized to that case, but um, sort of this, and so, so I think you should be able to do everything up until this, this chronic limit formula stuff in, in that setting. And then, well, this chronic limit formula was only, is only for G equals two. So there, mm -hmm. there's no, you know, I don't have a, you know, a general, you know, signature G minus one, one version of this anyway. Um, yeah. So you won't get things like zeta functions of other number fields. So you'll, you'll get things like, you know, things related to, to quadratic forms of, mm -hmm. um, but it's, yeah, I, I think it's potentially very interesting. I'd yeah. like to think about it more. Okay, great. Um, but yeah, the application is not as, not as clear as you say, you'd have to figure out what that would mean. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have another question. Um, yeah. Do you know about Swager's other paper? It's still signature minus one, one, 
Um, but do you know about his paper about, I think it's called mock mass theta functions, where you flip the, if you had a double sum minus a double sum, you kind of would flip the minus sign to a plus sign. And it seems like a small change, but it, and it all works analogously exactly as in his thesis. Um, but when you do a completion, you get completely different objects. So sometimes you get, um, uh, you get mass waveforms, but more generally you get something that, well, a mock modular form is some, you know, with the in, indefinite theta functions you were looking at today, right? If you're lucky, you get a, a modular form. If not, you get something that when you apply uh, the C operator to it, um, you get a classical modular form, yeah. right? But sometimes you're lucky in the completions in the kernel of C. Well, yeah. these things are things that when you insert the K Bessel functions to get the right differential equation, if you're lucky, it has eigenvalue a quarter and it's a mass waveform. But more generally, if you apply uh, delta minus a quarter to it, something coming from classical modular forms. So anyway, if you just flip some of the signs around, even for the uh, lattices of the same signature, you get completely different analogous objects that the proof works exactly as an thesis. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's a different world of objects. So I wonder like what the Mellon transforms that that would mean, or if you've thought about that or if those would I, I have, I have not thought about it. I, I, I'm, I would definitely like to like to look into that. Yeah. I, I don't know, but I would, I'm, yeah, that sounds potentially, yeah, potentially very interesting. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I'm not sure. Do you know Ian, if any, or Gene, if anyone's really looked at Mellon transforms of mock modular forms very much? Like has people, uh, has Katrin or somebody studied L functions of mock modular forms and like what this means really in, in the, that space or? No, I don't think so. I know for the Swagger's paper you're talking about, when you get, you get lucky and do the Moss waveform, that like falls into the period function paper of Lewis and Zavier, where you yeah. get that nice thing. They talk about the um, Yeah, mock modular forms in general, I, I don't really know. I know Katrin and some others have studied L functions for weakly holomorphic modular forms. And they worked out the regularization you have to do to get the Mellon transforms to converge. And that, you know, is the same amount of growth as the harmonic mass forms. So it's probably similar. But yeah, I mean it's really it's really interesting. It's it's really interesting um, from this point of view to um, yeah. Yeah. Really great talk. Um, any other questions for Gene? Yeah, I, I actually I have one. Yeah, um, yeah. So you had you had this theorem where if you specialize the indefinite zeta in a certain way, uh, you get the it's equal up to maybe some factors uh, to this different zeta equation. Yeah. Yeah. That thing. Where and that's where you have your connection to the start conjectures, right? Yes. Um, have you done any calculations or computations for? Right. So this is the case where you, what we're talking about, right? Where you get something nice if you specialize these parameters on the indefinite side correctly um, yes yeah, you end up with something actually modular for like the theta function it's um, it's one of the two cases is that um was that going to be your yeah go ahead sorry yeah, so i might be my question is if you've done any calculations kind of in general for like let's say you specialize it so it's not nice uh, on the indefinite side so maybe we have um uh, weird correction in the functional equation, do you still get something that shows up maybe as like a, uh, including some units for some fields or like have you have you searched for like for something like I've, that? I've, 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 yes, I've done, uh, yeah, I've done a fair bit of experimentation with that and haven't found anything. Okay. Um, there is, yeah, I guess, I, um, yeah, I, I guess I should say that right there, there are two types of specializations that gives you something modular on the, on the, or give you, right, uh, on the, give you a, yeah, on the data function side, right, you, you could, you could, this is, this is the case when there's some sort of symmetry, um, and there's also a case when you take a, a, ra a, a rational limit, you let, let the cone 
go to the whole cone of positivity and the, when you have a, 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 a rational, um, when your quadratic form splits us into, let's just say in the G equals two case, it's a product of two linear rational quadratic forms. And that, in that case, then you, you, would, you could get, get I haven't done it, but you, you'll get her with some combination of her with theta functions. Mm -hmm. And there could be some, some interesting, some interesting stuff there, not, not really from the class field theory point of view, but maybe some interest it just sort of combinatorially what you, what you get out that could, could be interesting. And I, I haven't really looked at it. Yeah. Great. Well, if there's no further questions, let's thank Gene again. Click the clap button. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. So if you're familiar with our seminar uh, or if you're new to our seminar, we usually stick around for a few minutes.